All right, so I have a little script here, an intro script that I'm going to run through. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you to those who are here with us on campus and to those of you who are joining us online. As Nick said, my name is Philip Arlen. I'm a course director here at Full Sail in web analytics, and I'm in the internet marketing department. I'm hosting this session that's titled, You're Only As Good As Your Team. So to those of us who might question what is this panel about, and that probably includes all of us, <laughs> it's about teamwork. So we're going to hear different perspectives on what teamwork is all about. So I'm going to introduce the panelists very briefly. I'm going to let each one do his or herself, or him or herself, justice by describing who they are and what they do. So starting to my immediate left, we have Grant Schonkweiler, who is a producer for Epic Games, 2008 game development graduate. To his left, Chris Klein, technical director at Pixar. I think some of you may have heard of them and a 2010 Hall of Fame inductee. To Chris's left is Larry Katz, second AD, 2013 Hall of Fame inductee. Then Lindsey Bush, independent filmmaker and, oh, excuse me, independent film and animation producer. And then finally, but definitely not least, is Matt Bush, who's an independent filmmaker and concept designer. So to get started, I told you that I'm a course director. I teach web analytics. And whether you know what web analytics is about or not, the word analytics definitely triggers something in your mind. It's somebody <laughs> who bogs himself or herself in a lot of data. And that can be a very lonely endeavor. And you might think, what is a web data analyst doing talking about teamwork? So one of the things that I always try to impart to my students is that data analysis is a great thing. You know, you really need to make sense of a lot of information that's coming together. But if you can't contextualize that information, if you can't make sense of what all of that data means in a larger context of what the company's goals are, what the website's goals are, then really your data means nothing. And so taking a team-based approach to data analysis is critical. And I think that's the only way one can be successful when trying to optimize a website. Now, that's no different than what each of these panelists is going to talk about today. So I'm going to kick it off by moving over to Grant and let him describe what teamwork means to him. All right. Uh, wow. It's a, it's a very big topic. Um, you know, the first thing that I would say is uh, what teamwork means to me is my job. Because uh, as a producer in video games, you literally would do nothing if you didn't have a team. Um, the weird thing about being a producer in games is you aren't actually producing anything. You're not actually doing anything uh, that is in the game, right? Um, so your main focus is on the team itself and uh, getting the team to work as a team. Um, so for me, uh, my job and the way it uh, involves teamwork is really making it so teamwork is naturally growing in the team, um, making sure that people can communicate easily, making sure that people, you know, uh, have lunch or dinner or whatever they might need um, when things are, you know, going a little hardcore. Uh, but really making sure that teamwork is happening um, is is the key to making a, a good video game. Um, unless you're an indie team of one or two people, well, even two, um, you can't make a game by yourself. It's, uh, it's very complex. It involves, you know, most of the arts that are taught here in some form or the other. Um, and it really is a giant collaboration. And if the collaboration isn't working and the team isn't working properly, you're just going to have a giant mess. And I'm sure anybody that plays video games has played a game that um, you've thought, wow, how did they do this wrong? Or how did they do this wrong? And you've played terrible games. Um, I would say probably about a 90% chance that it was teamwork and 10% chance it was uh, management, which is teamwork. So uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the gist of what teamwork <coughs> means to me. All right, fantastic. Thank you. Chris. Uh, hi. Uh, teamwork, what does that mean to me? Uh, I've been a, a leader of three teams on three different movies. Um, to me, being a leader of a team is allowing the team to do what they know how to do and just kind of making sure that everything is flowing properly and, uh, and everybody is basically doing what they're an expert at doing. Um, but I also wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the collaboration between teams at a company. Um, one of my biggest feelings of achievement on the, the film Brave that we worked on is that I was, I was a set modeling lead on, on uh, Brave. And one of the 
things that made that very hard movie fairly uh, uh, manageable between art and sets is that we kind of worked two teams together in a very collaborative way. And it wasn't an us against them kind of thing. It's, it's a, a collaboration between two different teams. And uh, sometimes I think that uh, teams can become somewhat isolated in a larger company. And it's very important to facilitate those relationships back and forth for ease of communication and just, uh, you know, collaborative, collabor collaboration in general. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I can talk about a little bit, bit about teamwork is that uh, for the last three years, I, I, was, I was away from Pixar and I was, um, I was a student and I was doing a lot of my own work. And uh, one of the things that I really missed about it, I think a little bit, was the collaborative environment and actually having all of these people that uh, you could bounce ideas off of back and forth instead of just working in my small little st uh, studio uh, by myself in isolation. Uh, that's something that I was craving wh when I was part of a collaborative team, but then once I was away from that, uh, it's something that I sorely missed, and I'm actually really happy to be part of a collaborative team now again at Pixar. Uh, I just started working there again uh, three weeks ago, and uh, I'm super happy to be back. Um, but yeah, teamwork is what makes it all happen, and uh, the communication between teams I think is very important as well. So in, in, uh, in the context of my job, um, you know, the team is the film crew. And more specifically, it's the AD department. So you have a first AD, a second AD, a second second, and then you have the production assistants. And so that is my team. And um, you know, the key to the team is that the people, there's a chain of command, and the people at the, at the bottom of that chain, uh, I expect those people to know what the people at the top of the chain know. And so, um, you know, the, it's important to, to take the initiative to get the information because it's never going to be spoon-fed to you. I don't have time to tell each of the PAs exactly what's going on, but the information is out there in the form of a call sheet, in the form of schedules. And so, uh, in, that, in that context, you know, everybody's accountable for, for getting the information, and those are the, the people that make up my team. I need everybody to know what's going on. And um, you know what's the most important thing is to know what the person above you in the chain of command, what their job is. And so as you guys get entry level jobs on a team, you need to know what your boss does so that you can anticipate what the needs are of everybody up that chain. And so uh, the people that I pick for my team are, you know, uh, these are entry level positions, so it's not gonna be somebody with a lot of experience. Um, it's somebody that has the attitude where they're gonna take the initiative to know what everybody on that chain of command is doing. So uh, for me, you know, teamwork is, is having a group of people that understand what the goal is of the whole group and uh, you know, up and down that chain um, are, are working towards that. So um, that's, that's my specific context uh, of a team. All right, hello everybody. Um, teamwork for me, I'm gonna backtrack a little bit here. Um, the very first team I was ever on, and hopefully some of you can relate to this because you might even be there right now, was uh, you know your typical jobs, right? You've got like McDonald's, Arby's, and I know that sounds crazy, but you work on a team there, right? You're all part of it, and that's, that's the fundamentals of it. That's where it starts. Um, when I was really young, my, I was really interested in puppetry and theater, and so that was kind of where my background started. And um, that is all teamwork. You want to talk about being on top of somebody when you're working in theater, and I'm sure some of you have, you're, you're literally right next to each other working the same puppet or moving around or this prop needs to come up here or there. And it is a team. And you're not only looking out for yourself, but you're also making sure that all of your teammates and members are on cue, hitting where they need to hit, when they need to hit it. Um, and just being a good teammate as well, right, with, uh, with your crew there. Um, and also, I think to be a good team, or to be a good team leader, you have to have first been a teammate and kind of know how that chain works. Um, and think about if you were ever to put a team together for a small film project that you're making, or even a project in school that you're working on currently, who would you want? What kind of members and contributing um, traits would you want in those people? Um, and I think, uh, I think having those attributes under your belt would make you a really great team member. And so now working on small independent films and animation type things myself, 
Um, I, I do try to remember those things, and you're not just thinking about you, and of course you want to do a good job, but I'm also constantly thinking about everyone else. Does everyone else have what they need uh, to get the project done to the best of their ability? What, uh, what could be better, right? We always want to strive for excellence, so I think building a good team will, will help you get there. I should have looked how to turn this on before I... Uh, <laughs> Teamwork here. Let me help Teamwork. you. Right. <laughs> you got it? Is there a button on the bottom? Testing. Oh, it's on already. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> should have checked that first, I guess. Um, so I have a, a kind of a, a segue story that comes a little bit out of left field. A neat teamwork story for me. When I was in high school in the first part of college, uh, music was actually my main focus, and I was in an awesome glam rock band. We were amazing, Woo! right? And I had uh, my hair, I used to have hair, but um, <laughs> when I had hair, it was dyed platinum blonde. It was down to my butt. I would hairspray it all over the place. But we had mild success, and man, I was putting in 210%. And the other guys, uh, two of the guys were putting in about 100%, but there was one person in the band, this, maybe some of you can relate to this, but there's always the one person in the band, ugh, they're missing band practice, you know, they got the significant other that they're hanging out with all the time. And there was this saying that I always heard, which was, your band is only as good as the weakest link. And that drove me bananas, because our band would only be as good as this guy who kept missing practice and everything else. So because of that, I was really interested in music and art and writing and movies and all that stuff. But that's actually the reason I got out of music was because I hated the idea that um, I would have to rely on the strength of a team. And that was kind of one of the things that pushed me into art was I, I felt like I was a little bit more in control of my own destiny. Um, the weird thing about it, though, was then to move out to Los Angeles and start working on movies, and it kind of thrusted me back into the uh, team thing. So I don't know if that's entirely true in the grand scope of something like a movie or an animated project, that it would only be as good as the weakest link working on that movie. I don't know if that's entirely true. But uh, in the sense of a band or smaller projects, uh, definitely you want to do everything you can to make sure everyone's on the same team, on the same page and uh, just kind of a good code to try to live by and uh, do what you can to make sure everyone's uh, putting forth the same effort. All right, that's really great. Um, just to give the audience an idea of how we're going to do this, I'm sure it's similar to other sessions. Uh, you've heard from each of the panelists um, a lot shorter than I was hoping for. <laughs> we've got plenty of time to go through some questions and tell more stories. I am going to open up the uh, discussion to you guys probably toward the end. We'll have a, a good 30 minutes or so for you guys to ask questions, so there'll be plenty of time of that for that. These guys have a really like fantastic resume, so I'm sure you'll be interested if you have questions about art or movies or music. I mean, growing your hair to your butt, there are a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of things we can learn today. I'm not sure we want the answers, but <laughs> it'll be interesting to, to learn. So I thought I'd um, start by picking up on <coughs> Lindsay's comment about leadership because that is certainly a really important aspect of, well, for the, that governs the success of any team. Um, as true as it is that a team is only as good as its weakest link, a team really can outperform itself if it has good leadership. And there are many different leadership styles. You may have learned this in class. You probably see this in everyday life. You can rule by fiat. You can rule by consensus and everything in between. And each team responds differently to different leadership styles. So I'm wondering if you know, maybe I can throw a question out, and it will be a fairly open-ended question. What sort of leadership styles have you encountered in your past, and what had worked best for you? Why? What was the example of the leader? Was it a personal thing? Was it something that just gelled the team together? Let's talk a little bit about leadership. As a freelancer, um, I've definitely seen every different leadership style of my boss, is, who's usually the first assistant director or the director. And you know, like you said, there's, that's, there's definitely two schools of thought on it, where you can be a real slave driver or you know, kind of the, the friendlier version. And uh, you know, um, I, I find, and you know, both of them are effective at the end of the day. As a producer, if you see that all the work got done and the budget was kept, then you, know, you can say, OK, that 
loud screaming style must work because <laughs> at the end of the day I'm not spending any more money than what we said and we got our shots and so that's why sometimes you might have a boss who's a, a maniac and a tyrant and you're wondering why does this person who mistreats people continue to get hired because at the end of the day they're you know they're getting the work done um, and it's not that's not my style uh, I prefer definitely a more laid-back style of you know making sure that everybody on the team knows what the information is, everybody knows what the, my goals are. Uh, I lay out my expectations at the beginning of a movie when I hire a crew and you know there's definitely a, a hiring process and an interview process to, to look for the right, the right people to, to fill the team. But I think it's important to let people on your team know what your expectations are ahead of time and then if they don't meet those expectations then there have to be consequences. Um, but uh, d you know there are definitely def uh, different management styles but I prefer the, uh, the more chill, kind of <laughs> laid back style. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I, I could talk about leadership for the entire panel. It's, it's what is probably my biggest passion and, and I've definitely, uh, you know, kind of echo, I've, I've seen everything. Uh, games, games are a little bit different in that uh, it, unlike a film crew, you don't disband after, after a project, hopefully. Um, that does happen, but hopefully you don't disband after a project. And in fact, you are continuing to work together. Um, and so, you know, I've seen, uh, the yelly type. I've seen the uh, dictatorial leader type. I've seen, uh, you know, the hero leader type, which is like, I'm out there, you know, in the middle of the trenches. And then I've seen that person leave and an entire studio crumble, right? So um, the leadership style that I, I try and embrace is, is a little hard for people to understand um, who have, one, never done it or two, never been part of it. And it's, uh, it's kind of a reversal of the typical way of, uh, of how people think of hierarchy. So, um, you know, if you look at a normal pyramid, right, there's the leader at the top and everybody kind of like goes up to that person and he dictates down. Um, the leadership style that I, I do is actually reverse. The higher you are, the lower you are, right? So I always tell people that being a producer is, is one of the lowest jobs at a, at a studio because you are your servant leader. Your job is to uh, fulfill every every need that a person has, uh, work related. Um, you know, to make sure that they're happy and they're healthy. And you know, a, a lot of times that includes making sure that their family is happy and healthy. And you know, oh, my desk doesn't roll properly. Okay, well, I'll buy you a new desk. It, you know, it's it's everything. Nothing is too small when you're uh, when you're a servant leader. And it's it's worked really well for me. Um, and it's really it's really important for especially in games because. Um, you know, I've I've crunched four months for 100 hours a week for four months with a team, and then had to roll straight into another project. Now, if I had been like yelly and screamy that whole four months, they would have they would have abandoned me. They would have all left the studio, or they would have, um, you know, got me fired or whatever. Uh, but because you know I was there in the trenches working with them, and I was you know helping them out. Um, you know, they were ready to roll onto the next project. Every, everybody took a break, um, but you know, they were ready to roll onto the next project because they were like, okay, at least we know that the people uh, that are helping produce or lead this project um, are gonna are gonna be there. They're gonna work through the the hard hours and they're gonna really help us out. So yeah. Lindsay, can I ask you to comment maybe a little bit more on on the good, leadership roles? Well, also specifically, good leaders were once good teammates. Wait, come again, I couldn't hear, sorry. Oh, good leaders were once good teammates. Yes. I like that. I do believe that is very, very true. Um, going back to my roots again, and again, I'm not there now, obviously, but I used to be. And uh, when I was in on that puppetry team, I remember I had a tyrant, like he was talking about a minute ago, who was my director for a while, and she was, she was stern. You didn't give her what she wanted, you'd get yelled at, okay? And so that was that was very intense. Now, I always tried to be a good teammate and not, uh, not make her angry, because I didn't like to get yelled at. Um, but later on, after I was at the age of 17, I actually started directing my own team. And uh, I ended up taking over the whole production. And so at that point, I tried to maintain my cool and be a good leader, because I remember getting yelled at by her and not liking that very much. So I ended up trying to be kind. And in leadership's defense, sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. It just depends on who your teammates are. Um, so you almost have to use a different formula for every single teammate that is a member of your team. And you learn ways to talk to everybody and ways to make them happy. And you know certain things that will make them smile, right? And you can kind of get the best work out of them. And you, you sort of learn how to, I don't want to say, manipulate, but <laughs> you kind of learn to manipulate the system a little bit to get the best out of your team. 
Jedi mind trick. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly like you, that. You basically are hacking people. That's what I <laughs> tell people. It's like every every person is a puzzle, and once you kind of solve their motivation, like I feel like leadership gets a lot easier. Are we talking about <clears throat> leadership or parenting? <laughs> <laughs> They're the, the same thing. They sound like the same thing. But that's a very astute point, Lindsay, about you know there is no one leadership style that can work for every team because mm -hmm. each team is comprised of different individuals. Some respond well to pushes. Some respond well to gentle nudges and others respond well to just get out of my way. Mm -hmm. So I think that's... I will say that, uh, <clears throat> at least in film production, the really good news is that it's always temporary. The movie always ends and you move <laughs> on to something else. So it's, it, it is important because you will uh, definitely encounter a boss like that. It's important to have a thick skin and to understand that it's not, it's not personal against you. If you're doing the best that you can, you know, uh, and the good thing is that it'll be over and then you can move on at least in freelance film production. That's, That's a really person. interesting point about the don't let it be personal. Yeah. Um, I was kind of thrust into leadership. I did a really good job in the character department on Incredibles, and then I was asked to be the set modeling lead for the film uh, in sets. And I was like, okay, yeah, I've never done a set or a prop at the studio. Sure, I'll lead the team. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of strange because the hardest thing when you're put into that position is when you have to manage or lead people who were your peers. And um, sometimes those people can be really, really um, hard to sort of accept that you're in that position. And, um, and finding that sweet spot of, 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 of maintaining a friendship and a leadership for that friend is actually probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. And I've failed miserably at it at times, and I've actually accomplished that at times as well, but uh, the whole leadership thing is a continually evolving and learning situation. And uh, yeah, I guess that's all I have to say about that. But um, yeah, le leading is hard, yeah. definitely hard. Leading is hard, sometimes being led is hard yes. as yes. well. If you are you know, in your heart of hearts, you see yourself as the leader, especially when you are with peers, yeah. you grew up together. So I want to follow up on um, the comment that Larry just made. And Chris, you'll have something to say about this. And Matt and Lindsay, now that you guys have your own independent film mm -hmm. in the works, this notion that movie sets are comprised of really high-functioning teams that have to be assembled quickly and then well, disassembled. Functioning. Just as, yeah. <laughs> hopefully functioning, <laughs> right? Um, how, so I guess I have so many questions about that. Uh, one of the talents in the film industry must be picking a really good team. And availability is obviously an issue if people are working on other sets. But it is so crucial to get that, that mix, that chemistry right on day one. Otherwise, you know, the budget starts going down. And if you have to start from scratch, that can, shoot, that can blow a whole movie. So how, how, does, how does that work? Um, well, I've got, I'm uh, oh, sorry. I've got one thing that, um, one of the things that I've kind of learned both early in my career when I was working on bigger movies in Los Angeles and what we're doing right now in Michigan, um, and that is getting your team fired up and getting them passionate about the project is huge. So um, one of my interesting stories is uh, when I was, um, uh, I had an agent for working on movies doing concept art. And at the time, I was already doing a lot with Star Wars, and uh, my agents had this new sci-fi movie that was coming out, and they called me up one day, and they said, listen, we know you're the Star Wars guy. This movie is gonna be the new Star Wars. It's gonna be amazing. We're gonna send you the script over the weekend, and um, we want you to start work on it next week. And it's called The Matrix. And I said, sweet. So I read the script over the weekend, and it was the dumbest thing I ever read. I couldn't believe it, it was just awful. At the time, though, uh, Tom Cruise was supposed to play Neo. And I thought, well, Tom Cruise always gives 100%. Maybe it'll be kind of cool. But I read the script, and I just did not see it at all. So I went and I worked on The Matrix for a week. And it was really interesting, because when I was brought in, 
everyone there was so excited about the movie and I was working with a team of, of uh, guys and girls on concept art and everyone was just so jazzed about this movie. And I, I remember asking a couple of times, you read the script, right? Like, what, what is everyone so excited? About? Like, I just, I didn't get it. So anyway, long story short, after working on it for a week, my agent called me over the weekend and the movie had been canned because Tom Cruise left to go shoot another movie called Eyes Wide Shut. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of like, thank God, right? <laughs> well, um, a month later, my agent called and said, listen, very excited. The Matrix is back on, but now it's starring Keanu Reeves. And I was like, oh my gosh. The well, it's like six months dialogue. worth of work. Do you want it? And I said, ah, you know, give me an afternoon to think about it. True story, uh, the same afternoon I got a call from another agent that said, listen, we've got a movie that we want you to work on. I said, all right, tell me about it. They said, it's called The Devil's Own. I said, ooh, that sounds good. Well, tell me more. And they said, it stars Harrison Ford and Brad Pitt. I said, say no more, I'm in. The Devil's Own with Harrison Ford and Brad Pitt. How bad can that be, right? <laughs> so I called back my other age, agent, said, The Matrix, bye bye no thank you. So I go to work on, I don't know if you guys have even heard of this movie called The Devil's Own, but uh, it's not very good. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen this movie called The Matrix. It's amazing, right? So uh, one of the things that it kind of taught me, though, uh, a couple things. One, to have more of an open mind. Um, but in talking about even things like leadership, no one ever brought me in to show me why this movie was amazing. I had the script, and I mean, I should, it was a good learning thing for me. Um, to have more of an open, you know, open mind to it. But it would have been great if someone would have pulled me aside, hey, this is what everyone's doing, everyone that has been working on this, this is why everyone's excited. I guess I could have asked questions differently. I could have viewed it as the glass is half full as opposed to half empty. So what I've learned from that in making my own movie now, anyone new that we bring into the team, I'm showing them concept art, I'm showing them footage. I want to make sure whether they're getting paid or not getting paid, I want to make sure that the people on my team are absolutely excited and really jazzed about, uh, about what they're doing. I've, I've heard people call that bringing them on the journey with you. You know, it's like you're on a quest and you're like, come on, and the guy's like, why? And you're like, no, no. You tell them everything about it and then they're like, yeah, all right, we can do this. So yeah, it's super cool. Um, in the, con in the again, in the context of my particular you know job, um, so your first day you're, you're going to be a production assistant, your entry level, and your first day you're going to show up in the production office to do your paperwork. And I, you know I wish I could show you the concept art and get you excited, but you know you have to be excited about it. You have got you got landed one of these coveted roles, and so when you're in that production office, there's paperwork, there's scripts, there's sides, there's storyboards, there's call sheets and schedules, and you need to take that and take initiative and read it and understand what's happening. And then uh, another thing, another thing about that makes a really great leader is being able to answer questions. And you know, I want you, my entry level people on my team to ask questions. However, I want you to see if you can answer the question yourself first, given the information that's out there. I'm very busy. I've taken the time to create all of this paperwork and all this information, and I want you to look at it and read through it and see if you can answer your own questions. And what it's going to do is generate better questions. And I will say there are no stupid questions, but there are really stupid times to ask questions. <laughs> so it doesn't matter if you have like the best, most relevant question. If I'm about to blow up a car and I'm, consider, I'm really concerned about safety and people and where the director's gonna be and where the fire extinguisher's gonna be, and you walk up to me and say, uh, next Tuesday is the catering tent, can we parked over there or over there? That might be a very good question, but that's a horrible time to ask it. So whenever you guys have, you know, might, might have the best question in the world, ooh, 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 but just take a second, read the room a little bit, and see if that's a good time to ask the question. And you know, there, with, uh, with Google and the internet, You've heard of that thing on the computer. Uh, there is almost no question that you cannot answer yourself with a quick Google search. And so if you're an entry level person that's trying to get on my team and you walk up to me and it's a good time to ask a question, but you ask a question that I know within three seconds of a Google search, I could find out 50 answers to that question. I'm gonna you know, roll my eyes and categorize you in a different place. So keep that in mind as you, you know, there's no, you know, think about the questions you want to ask 
And the people that are on my team, I want them to ask questions. And if you become a leader, you should want to answer questions to make sure that everybody's on the same page. But just to go along with what you're saying, you know, I want you to be excited about the project, but you have to take the initiative sometimes to, to, to get all that information so that you can get on board. You should be excited that you got one of the three or four jobs as a PA, and then I need you to take the initiative to, to learn as much as you can about the project. So in summary, there are no stupid questions, just stupid times to ask a question. Yes. <laughs> there's, there are stupid questions, uh, but, and there's def but there are great questions, and if you think about what you're asking, and again, if you can answer it yourself, then that might lead to a more focused question that if you ask me, I'll say, wow, that's a good question. You did the homework, as much homework as you could before you, you know, took my time to ask this question, so that's good. So there's this notion in, in math that applies. You probably hear it um, all the time in every day society. It's called regression to the mean. Basically, you, you can see a really great performance, let's say, in an athlete, for example. But overall, that person is going to be as good as he or she performs over the duration of a career. That's the regression to the mean, the average performance. Um, the title of this session is you know, somewhat evocative of that. You're only as good as your team. That means there is an average performance level across the team, and you are, you as an individual, no matter how big a star you are, you will only be seen in the context of your team. Your performance will reflect the performance of the team. So I think it was, uh, was it Matt? You, you were talking about the weakest link on a team, really having a big impact on the team. So in that, in that, sort of spirit of you're only as good as your weakest performer, what do you do about that weakest link? Boy, that's a good question. Um, uh, you, you do your best to uh, try to bring that person back up to speed, w you know, whatever that is. It's one of the things I'm actually uh, struggling with now as a, you know, directing um, a fairly large scale independent movie uh, wearing the director hat, trying to be creative, but also as a leader, where do I draw the line between um, being top dog and also being in the trenches, working with everyone? Hey, do you need this and that? It's a lot of things to focus on and try to, uh, you know, to think about. So that's definitely, uh, actually, I was hoping to get some good juice from you guys about, in terms of leadership, but it's, um, uh, it's tough. Every situation's a little bit different. Um, but usually the best thing is just if time allows it to pull the person aside and kind of try to figure out where the problem is, what we can do to fix it, um, if we can do something to fix it. I think delegating less responsibility to the weakest link is probably the best solution too sometimes because, I mean, if they're proving to be weak, then they must not be able to handle as much. So that's kind of how I deal. I'll, I'll just say um, it, it's a freelance world. Uh, we don't we don't sign contracts, and so sometimes if you're the weakest link, then I'll call somebody else and get them there that day, and have them there. You know, uh, that's just the reality of this. What you guys are trying to get into, you're talking about very competitive industry, and you know a few different slots. And um, you know, a nice thing that my boss actually says is that you're only as good as the people you hire. And that's really nice when he says that because he hires me. And so I like when he says that. But that just goes, that's just another way of saying what you guys have already been saying. You're only as good as the people you hire. Um, but just, yeah, you, you have to remember, you know, it's a freelance world. And if you're not on top of your game, you know, that, that could be it. And there's, there's a lot of people that are at home waiting for that phone call. And I'm not trying to, you know, be brutally real here, but that is, uh, that is the reality of it. I think one of the things that I, I like to do in a situation where, uh, you know, somebody's underperforming or performing less than you expect them to perform is just to be direct, immediately direct with them about what the problem is and kind of put it onto their shoulders as a problem that they need to fix. I'm not there to babysit them. Like, they were hired for this job because they were deemed, you know, capable of the job. And I just lay it out there right on the line. It's like, you know, you were hired to do this job, this is what your expectations are, you should know what these expectations are, and you really need to pull, pull it together. And then, um, you know, there are, there are 
there are things that you can do within a corporate sort of environment like personal improvement plans and things like that, but those are oftentimes far more work than <laughs> than than you ever want to you know dedicate to something like that. So I always try to pull that person aside and have a real sort of like heart to heart with them, try to let them raise it up to the level it needs to be. And oftentimes, you know, people don't understand that they're not doing what they need to do, and they just need to be told that. And oftentimes, they'll just rise to the occasion, which is what you want. Yeah, things are things are pretty different in the game industry because there is a high cost in every member on your team. Because unlike film, a lot of times, uh, especially like my job now, we fly the people in, we interview them, and then when they get a job, we pay for them to move there, and their families move there, and then they're under a contract and yeah we could still fire them at any point and like i'm sure that happens and it's happened in other studios i've been in but uh you know i can't just go up to my my bosses or the managers and be like hey this person is isn't performing well we should fire them and then they'll be like we already spent x amount of dollars to get them here so what is the what is the solution to you know go through a whole bunch of things before we get to that point and you know performance plans are a thing but I, I think what you were saying is very clear. A lot of times it's just people don't know. Um, we try and have, uh, you have like a one-on-one -on -one with your, your direct superior uh, every, t every other week. And that really helps because that person will be really honest with you and be like, hey, you're not performing. You know, the worst thing that can happen to any job is, uh, you know, you're there for a while, uh, up to a year or however long, and you get your review and people are like, yeah, you really suck at this. And you're like, why didn't you tell me that that was literally nine months ago? Why didn't you tell me nine months ago that I was sucking at this so I didn't continue to suck for nine months? Um, you know, at this point, I could have corrected myself. Uh, so, you know, it's sitting down with the person, figuring out what, what the problem is, because a lot of times I've found their problem at work is not because of something at work. It's actually because of something outside of work, which is probably outside of your control. So, you know, lowering responsibility while they, you know, get a divorce or, you know, go through a court case or whatever. Um, you know, just figuring out the types of things that they, they can improve on, the things that they do excel at. Um, you know, I've seen people um, who have really been struggling with something and, you know, they sit down with their lead and their lead talks them through it and they realize, well, they've been doing that for 10 years and they're no longer passionate about it. But what they're really passionate about and good at is this other thing. So it's like, well, maybe we should put them on that for, you know, a couple of weeks and all of a sudden they become your top performer. So there's a lot of different ways you can kind of go through and figure out that, you know, how to improve, uh, you know, a person who is struggling. But ultimately, there are people that are, you just can't fix and uh, they're burnt out on the place they're at or they're just tired of working on first person shooters, whatever. And it's like, hey, here's the option. You leave or I fire you, you know. So it can be it can be pretty brutal when you get to that point. I just want to follow up on one thing that uh, that Grant said. Um, and as far as uh, being a good team member, and you know, life always comes first and there's things in your life that will happen and deaths in the family and like major trauma that will happen and you need to deal with that. That's always gonna be more important than the movie or the video game that you're working on. But um, you know, uh, there's little things that happen in your life. There's fights and there's drama. And um, to be a, you know, a good team member, you need to learn how to separate that from your daily work life. If, you're, if you had a fight with your girlfriend the night before and you're in a poopy mood, then I don't want to see that on the set. You know, I don't want to see that on the set. Your poopy mood is now, in, you know, is now influencing the creative people on the set, the director and the actors who are trying to get to a, a space, a creative space. And so you need to, you know, in our jobs, you need to learn how to separate what's going on in your personal life from what goes on at work. When you're at work, I don't need to know about, your, you know, that you're sad or whatever's happening in your personal life. So that just goes uh, along with being a good member of a team. You have to be able to separate that. When you step out of your car, just, okay, I had a fight with my girlfriend last night, it's gotta go away. I don't wanna know about that. Again, there's major things that happen in your life, that takes precedent over the, the, little, the movie that we're making or the video game that we're making, but if it's little things, you have to learn how to, to separate that. You, you would be shocked, especially when you become in a place of leadership, how that can be read super easily. Like, uh, you know, when I was just a, a game programmer, you know, I would have bad days and I just sit at my desk code away or whatever but as soon as I was thrust into a position of leadership I walked in one day and I was like kind of like and everybody was like 
oh, well, he's in a bad mood, so I'm going to be in a bad mood. Next thing I knew, my entire team was in a bad mood. And I was like, why are you all so angry today? And they're like, well, because you're angry. And I'm like, oh, well, good point. So yeah, it's a, I, I, I do the car door thing, right? Like when I shut the car door at work, it's work. When I shut the car door leaving work, it's home. And uh, that kind of, that works. For it takes me. some practice to be able to separate oh, it like that. A lot of practice. But it's important. Five years. <laughs> People, you, you know, for to get one of these coveted, jobs and you know we work long hours you know you have to be somebody who people want to be around for 18 hours and so that's your attitude that's your personal hygiene that's uh and you know i have to mention that to full sale students a lot <laughs> <laughs> you know if i don't you know it doesn't matter how talented you are and educated you are if i can't be within three feet of you <laughs> and i don't want you on my team you know look it's it's just a it's a it's logical you know we're working very long hours and your attitude and the way that you present yourself has to be you know something that people want to be around for that period of time present company excluded of course <laughs> yeah you guys smell nice in here <laughs> yes <laughs> so yeah this is a, a great discussion it's funny i i I guess we all sort of were thinking, which direction is this panel going to go? So it's gone from more of a team focus to a leader focus. And I guess I'm sitting here with five leaders who all have thoughts on how a team can best perform, which is fantastic. So just building on that previous conversation, um, probably the answer is self-evident. Uh, it certainly is going to be obvious to me, but I'll throw out the question anyway. What do you prefer, uh, good morale or good performance? Hmm. <laughs> you know, there's that, that sports analogy, which is really an awful term, but the cancer in the clubhouse, usually by consensus, everyone agrees, if there's somebody who's poisoning the locker room, you get rid of that person immediately. And it doesn't matter if that guy is, you know, in baseball hitting 350 with 45 home runs. You get that person out of there as quickly as possible because he's bringing down the team. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would definitely say good morale, which is ultimately uh, a good team, right? Uh, I would rather have one person who is a great team worker, uh, you know, great at working within the team and okay, or, or very good at what they do, as opposed to a rock star. I have worked with rock stars and been part of firing rock stars that are the best at what they do in the game industry. There is no one else in the industry better than this person. And like the other artists were like, oh my God, we're firing this guy. And we're like, yeah, it's gonna happen. It has to happen. We fired him and within a week, everybody on the art team was like, wow, that was the right decision. Hmm. You know, it was, he literally is the top environment artist, one of the top environment artists now, not, not, not still there, but he was the top environment artist in the game industry at the time. And he just was, it was, you know, a lot of out, outside forces, but he was just not in a good place. And he was a cancer to the group. He was bad-mouthing one group to another group and then going to the other group and bad-mouthing that group and like he was bad-mouthing the game direction and bad-mouthing just everything right and so finally the the call went through all of the leadership and it was like all right he's got to go and th that that week the, the first week he was gone was was bad because people were like oh if, if that guy got fired we're all we're all screwed right but within two to three weeks everybody was like oh wow we're like we can be friendly with each other and I'm sorry that he was bad-mouthing you to me and stuff like that so yeah I would say a, a good team player, good, someone with uh, good morale, and, and good at what they do, obviously. Mm -hmm. The people I hire, you know, uh, it's not mutually exclusive. I want performance and a good attitude, you know, but uh, sometimes it's the, the head of the snake that is the, you know, that has the bad attitude and that can bring morale down. Yep. So another um, important, uh, uh, you know, attribute for a leader is, you know, if you get yelled at, don't, pass that down the chain necessarily. You know, you can be the buffer sometimes and just take all the abuse and it doesn't, you don't have to, it just goes along with what I said before about kind of separating bad things that are happening to you. So, you know, if, if I'm getting yelled and screamed at by Michael Bay, for example, then I don't necessarily need to pass that down to the rest of my team. As a leader, I can absorb that and, and keep morale high with the rest of the team. But the people that I hire, the people underneath me, I expect a good attitude and performance. So, what are you saying about Michael Bay? <laughs> hey, I haven't even worked with the guy, but uh, he's got a, he's got a reputation for blowing things up, right? Yes. <laughs> People in cars. Matt, Lindsay, you guys have any thoughts? I'm sure. Again, you'll probably go with good morale while not yeah, sacrificing performance. I would probably have to go with morale too, because um, 
even if, I don't know, I feel like everyone can come in and lift the one bad apple up. It's a lot easier to take, you know, the positive energy from most of your team and uplift the one negative person than uh, the other way around, obviously. So, and like it was already stated before, that's obviously going to give you a better performance. Um, the final product is going to be so much better because everybody had a good time doing it and, um, and working hard. Well, you hope the final project, if, if you had to pick. I mean, that's just such a hard, it's a hard pick between those two. Yeah, I would say um, attitude counts for a lot, a lot, a lot. And one of the things that I notice both as a fan of movies, animation, pop culture, but also working on the inside of the industry, on the outside of it, people always talk about like their favorite actor, actress, animator. They talk about how good they are. But on the inside of the industry, no one really talks about that. They talk about what they were like on set. So. You don't really hear on, on the inside when people talk about Natalie Portman, and I won't say what they say about Natalie Portman, but no one says how amazing of an actress she is, which she is. They talk about what it was like, oh my God, on the set, you know, working with this person or that person. And uh, so definitely attitude is, it's, it's what people think of you. It's what, uh, it's how you're perceived. So um, attitude definitely counts for a lot, for sure. Yeah, and in a place like Pixar where you go from like movie to movie and you, you, you tend to um, you know, work with a lot of the same people on the next movie and everything. Uh, <clears throat> the bad apples tend to like fall off the tree eventually and uh, you, know, you, you just won't get cast onto the next movie and you'll be sitting around going like, what am I gonna do? And then you know, eventually you either get the message or you don't. Um, <clears throat> but I, again, I'm still a true believer that you know, talking to that person directly and making sure that they're aware that they're not doing what they need to be doing is very, very important and making sure that they're aware. Um, yeah. The, the bad apple falling off of a tree sounds like the next Pixar short. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh, it does. You spoiled it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess Chris will be looking for a job. Yeah. Soon, um, I think that that's a really strong practical advice for you guys who are students. I think one thing Full Sail does extraordinarily well is not just teaching the technical skills about what you'll need to do in whatever job you're interested in pursuing, but also how to conduct yourselves on the set or in the office, in the studio, uh, depending on your discipline. And I think everything we just talked about reinforces that. Yeah. One other thing is like, when I was a student here, and I don't know if it's still the case, I'm sure it's not, because everybody is like super great attitude, right? <laughs> but there was a certain <laughs> set of people. Why were you laughing? <laughs> oh. There was a certain set of people that I immediately identified as the people that are probably going to have a harder time in life, and the people who are really sort of motivated to sort of achieve something in life. Mm -hmm. Stay away from those people over here. Yep. They're nothing but poison. What were your criteria? How did you? What was the the binary that you used? <clears throat> the constant complaining, the moaning, the bitching, like, oh, I paid all this money, mm -hmm. I'm not getting what I expected out of the school. Woe is me. Uh, it's more about like, you know, hang out with the people who are like, wow, look at look at the opportunity that I have here to do this now. Like, I have the time. I'm a student. I have the the motivation. I have the equipment. I have the the, the resources to be taught by by people who know what they're talking about. Uh, the people over here, the, the they're they're poison. Just just stay away from those guys because those are the guys that I'm gonna hire one day and go like, oh wow, that's the bad apple that's eventually gonna fall off the tree. You know, it's like, yeah. That's, it's, that's a great point. And, um, you know, as you guys are building teams, you know, there, there can be a, a separation between people that are your friends and people that you want to work with. Yeah. Um, there's an expression, it's not show friends, it's show business. So yeah. there are people that I like that are personal friends of mine that are in the entertainment industry that work in film production, but I wouldn't necessarily hire them or recommend them. If you recommend somebody for a job that you can't take, then that person is, you know, that you're putting it out there that, this person is my equal and that you know they're representing me in a sense so uh, th there can be a separation between people that you enjoy hanging out with and people that you want to work with so it's important to, to realize that you might have to hurt some of your friends feelings that you know if you get a gig and you're building a team and you don't you know it's okay to you know to not put somebody on your team that's going to be a bad apple or that's going to have a negative attitude if you recommend bad people recommendations and it becomes a finite resource, right? Like your your reputation is 
one of the best things that you will have in no matter what industry you go into. And if you recommend one bad person, then part of your reputation goes away and then two bad people. And by three or four, like you, your reputation shot probably possibly for the rest of your career because it's like, well, I'm never going to listen to his advice on that. And then next thing it's, well, I don't want to work with him either, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the message, positive attitude. Obviously be a good performer, but always come to it with a positive attitude because you know the fields that these guys represent they're really large but i think what's implicit in what they're saying is the worlds are small mm. everyone knows everybody they all jump from team to team particularly in movies but certainly in the other disciplines um chris i want to pursue one comment you made in your introduction that had to do with inter-team collaboration one team collaborating with another team that's a really difficult thing to control. Right. Um, that certainly can inspire great leadership in somebody who's overseeing both, but sometimes you might have divergent goals in both of those teams, but yet they have to work together. Um, what, do you, what do you have to say about you know, the role of one team and how they uh, might perceive the actions of another team and getting past any internal competition or dynamic, weird dynamic that might go for, on? For me, I think what, the responsibility is on the leaders of each team. And those leaders of each team have to sort of establish the relationship before the team sometimes even exists. And um, that in itself can actually be a really big effort. Um, there's this perceive, this perception between art and tech, technical sometimes. And like art is very much like, oh, we don't trust those guys that they're gonna give us what we want. Uh, and technical's like, those guys just wanna nitpick our stuff to death. And you know, it's, there's, just, uh, there's just always fight back and forth. Um, I have to say though on Brave, what we did is we were, because of construction on a, of a new building, we were actually placed into a situation that was a, a little different than normal. Uh, right now, art and technical are on different sides of the building, but we were kind of put into one sort of common area, and we found that being in that common area and being able to throw things back and forth without having to walk all the way across the building or actually make the effort to go, you know, in intermingle with, with the other team was a very sort of successful thing. Um, and uh, so I, I think it starts with the leadership, of course, but it's also sort of doing team building things together, like getting the two teams together and, and going on outings together and, and you, know, you know, sort of getting everybody to know everybody is a very important thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, it sounds hokey, right? I mean, the, these notions that corporate retreats are there for bonding exercises. And it but, feels hokey sometimes. Yeah. But it really does help. I mean, I think if you give in to what the overarching mission is for everybody to feel like they're part of something together, yeah. that really can strengthen the ties both within a team and across teams. Definitely, That's definitely. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts on um, collaboration, on teams? You know, it's different in movies, right? There, there's very rarely do you work with another uh, movie set, but well, you know, each, production you know, needs to get along with each department is its own team. You have the yeah. grip department, the electric department, the camera department, and you know there can be sometimes uh, not, people not wanting to work together. But I don't, I don't understand that. I mean, we should all be moving forward to give the director the maximum time to work with the actors and move efficiently. And so I, I really try to foster, uh, you know, really good communication and and a good teamwork between across all the departments. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know. Uh, in the AD department, one of the coolest things is that I have to know kind of like what every department does. It's one of the few departments that I know pretty much what every department does. And so, but I think it's important, again, it's initiative that you can take on your own to know what the other departments are doing. You should know. It's not, I'm just in the wardrobe department. That's my only job. Mm -hmm. You know, you are working in a, in a bigger team and you're, you're trying to get your specific job done, but you have to see how that fits in the big picture. If you're super, you know, uh, defensive about your one thing and it's my one job and you don't see the big picture then you're not being a good team player you know and it's a bunch of teams working together in the uh, in the independent film industry there you don't really have a department the department's like one person you know? so we got like we got one sound guy we got one person doing wardrobe we got one person on set um, dressing that day you got one person on making sure that the props are where they need to be and all that kind of stuff um, so each person is representing their own department. And if we were not to get along like a family, that would be incredibly, incredibly difficult. And so we do have an extremely close relationship on set and also off set um, that we've developed over time. And it does help us 
function mo way more fluently than if we wouldn't have had those relationships. Family is a great way to describe a film crew, by the way. Oh, yeah. Uh, best advice I ever got, ever, about anything to do with my career or the industry actually came from my mom. And I love my mom, but she's, she can be very, she's laughing, she can be very hokey. And even when my mom said this, I was probably a teenager and I rolled my eyes and said, oh God, mom, right? But the thing she told me, best advice I ever got, if you want to soar like an eagle, don't hang around turkeys. <laughs> Yeah, I left too. <laughs> but it's good stuff. Hmm. I'm not sure where to go after that. <laughs> it's pretty good, though. Um, let's see. We probably have time for one more question from me. I would love to shut myself up by um, just in general. <laughs> we'll open up the to <laughs> questions from the audience uh, soon. <clears throat> Maybe the last thing that I'll throw out to the panel, uh, this is something that I prepped you guys in advance for, so I'm hoping we're gonna get something good, which is give us either a heroic team story or just a disaster team story, something that went complete opposite of what you had hoped. I'm sure we all have these in our background, but we'd love to hear something where teamwork went really well or unfortunately not. I'll, uh, I guess I'll start with a her heroic story. Um, so. When I worked at id Software, we were working on a first-person shooter called Rage, and uh, basically some things happened, uh, and we were outsourcing our um, our multiplayer, and that didn't work out. And so I was on a multiplayer team working on another game, and they came to us and said, uh, we need a multiplayer component for Rage uh, before we ship the game. And we're like, that, that sucks for you guys. And they're like, no, we need, we need it. And we don't have a studio to do it, so we need you guys to do it. And we looked down and we were like, that's five months from now. And they're like, yeah. And uh, so if you guys don't know, a AAA first person shooter multiplayer component usually takes anywhere between four years and 21 months, uh, never shorter than that. And uh, we had a team of less than, a, uh, we had 18 people. And so we said, okay, well, this is what we're gonna do. And it started out with design process and then we got into full production within like two weeks. And um, then we basically worked uh, 100 hour weeks for four months and we got the game done and we, we shipped it. And the thing that was craziest about it was, um, you know, the game itself got pretty mixed reviews, you know, whatever, our 78, on Metacritic or something like that, but every single review called out the multiplayer as unique and interesting and exciting and different. And um, you know, the, the first day that the game went live, we jumped on and we played with a bunch of random people and people were talking about how, you know, oh, we expected it to be just like every other first person shooter, uh, but it wasn't. It was this interesting car combat where you kind of drove around and blew each other up and it was really fun and different. And uh, you know, that was really, came out of constraints because we knew we weren't going to be able to do this stereotypical thing in four months. And so we were like, okay, well, this makes sense. Let's do this. Um, and very quickly, everybody got on board with what the vision was and how we were going to get to that point and, you know, divided and conquered work. Um, you know, there were crazy things that happened during that time. Uh, there were disasters within the success. Uh, you know, I always tell people, you know, there's a point when you know that your team is losing their mind when you have a programmer who's screaming at a PS3 at four in the morning, just screaming, and just incoherent words, just like, ah! And that, that's the breaking point. Your team is broken at that point. I, I actually picked the guy up and threw him in an elevator and took his badge from him so he couldn't get back into the building. Um, but we basically came together as a team and, and played the game every day. And that was where we realized oh, there's 18 of us, and we're working really, really hard on this project, and we're seeing that there are huge steps being taken every day. And you would play the game you know, at 2 o'clock every day, and from 2 o'clock until 2 a.m., people would work that 12 hours. They'd come back at 9 a.m. or whatever and work. And so there was basically more than two days' worth of work going on every day uh, being put into the build, and so it was very significant. And you know that whole experience was insane and I never want to do that again and I never wish that upon any of you but the the coming togetherness of that team like I'm closer with those 18 people than I am with any team I've ever worked with because I bled with them literally blood all over the studio that I had to clean up it was amazing um, <laughs> you know I've cried with them I've I've gone through you know the equivalent of a war zone with with that team um, 
and we were strong. As soon as we came out of that and rolled back onto the project we were on, we hit the ground at, at a speed that you would not expect from a team that had been crunching that hard for four months. Um, but it was because at that point we were, you know, you mentioned family. At that point we were a family and we were going to stick together and work, work through our problems. So, yeah. Fantastic. Anyone else? <clears throat> well, I, I, still, I still consider that relationship on Brave between sets and art uh, a really big accomplishment as far as teamwork and how teams interdepartment teams work together. But there is another moment that happened uh, on Wally -E where I was the modeling lead and <clears throat> it was kind of late in the game and I don't know if, if you've seen Wally, -E, but there's this truck where he has all these little like compartments and each of those compartments has like a, a story and where Wally -E collects all of these similar things. And uh, that was presented to the sets department one day, uh, kind of out of the blue a little bit. And there was just so much stuff to model that uh, my supervisor and I looked at each other and we were like, that's impossible, we're never gonna get that done. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, basically we came up with a quick plan and uh, assembled every single model, we just sort of gathered every single modeler uh, at the studio to accomplish this thing because it had to be done in like two weeks. And uh, the way that that all kind of came together and the way that, again, the art department and, and the sets department kind of made an agreement that we're going to take it to a certain level and based on camera information, we'll plus it from there. But I was really proud of the team, how they basically took that on and uh, accomplished it. And basically each cubicle, like one model had to model like 20 things in each one per day in order to get it done. And uh, that, for me, that was one of the hardest um, managerial things that I had to do because I had to schedule that with all of the, the modelers and, and uh, sort of manage 23 people, every modeler at the studio, and a lot of them I hadn't worked with before, but they really rose to the occasion and sort of pulled it off, and that was a really good moment. Um, so I had told you guys earlier, one thing that you can do to, to be a good team member is to always think about what your boss's job is so that you can anticipate what they're going to need. And so I just have an example of one time, you know, where I, and, I, and I've been lower on the rung and climbing up. It takes a long time to climb up the, the, the production side. And so I've been, you know, a team member longer than I've been a leader. And uh, we, on the movie Night and Day, we were in Boston and we were doing a shot on the Zakem Bridge, which is a big white suspension bridge that's been in a lot of movies. And it was a helicopter shot, and we wanted a caravan of cars going across the bridge, and we needed a lot of other uh, cars on the bridge as well, but we needed to own all the cars. We weren't gonna shoot any of, uh, you know, just random people, so uh, they, they wouldn't let us lock down the bridge, and what we, need, what we had was a rolling roadblock, so the police would get out in front of traffic and go slow, so that they, the traffic would be moving but slowly, and then we could put our cars on the bridge and get this helicopter here, because they didn't want the helicopter flying near the bridge with normal traffic going by and people getting freaked out. So um, we wanted to do it twice, so we had two groups of these caravans standing by and another 50 cars that would drive by with them and police standing by and helicopters and uh, Matthew Dunn is the first assistant director I work with and he was organizing the whole thing. I was a second assistant director and my role was, you know, a smaller role, but I still, in all the preparation, you know, knew what he was doing. And so it comes uh, on the moment to do it and all, everyone's in place and the police are there and the helicopter's standing by and uh, Matthew's walkie-talkie is out of range. And so you have the helicopter pilot going, Matthew Dunn, come in. Matthew, do you copy? And we have this very narrow window of time to do this shot. Matthew, do you copy? Does anybody copy? Uh, hi, this is Larry. Larry, who are you? Uh, I'm the second AD. All right, well, we're ready to do the shot. Can you make it happen? So get my phone. I get Matthew on the phone. I got the walkie. And because I had paid attention to prep and understood what his job was, I was able to step in, and we got the shot. And I didn't freeze like a deer in the headlights, but that's <laughs> just preparation. And so it was a time that I got to be a hero and got a lot of attaboys and, uh, you know, you're only as good as the people you hire. So it was a good feeling. But, you know, uh, I, it, what I did was not in the scope of my job. It was my understanding of uh, what it meant to be a great team member and how I could help my boss that put me in a position to be able to accomplish that. Yeah. There's a signal that we have time for maybe two questions. Mm. Is, that, is that true? 
Maybe tell your story and then we'll no, take one question. I'll be short. Mine's, okay. mine's short. It's not as elaborate as that, but it does have something to do with shooting on location as well. Um, we had a shot where we had to go out to some dunes and we had to take this big port, what do you want to call it, portal? Yeah, you, the portal, yeah, I don't yeah. even know what the official term is, he does. And uh, <laughs> it was really, really heavy, like ridiculously heavy, where we actually had to like wheel it out on a tire because nobody could lift it. And, uh, and just had we not had our whole team helping contribute with running that stuff back and forth, I mean, it was about a two mile hike into the, the more secluded area of the dunes where there was no footprints or anything. So um, just a simple way to bring teamwork back in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every, uh, there's so many examples, it's hard to even think of one in particular, but any past project, whether it was a huge success or a huge failure, when I think back on them, rarely is it attributed to one person that rocked it or one person that, that failed, but usually my memories are like, if it was a success, like, man, that was such a great team, and if it was an epic failure, it was like, man, what could have we done to, to have brought that team together tighter to have made that work better? So teamwork for sure. Great. All right, do we have any questions in the audience? We can probably get the first one here. My question is, um, if you, I mean, what is the biggest difference, do you think, working in independent film as opposed to working in a company when you're leading? Well, um, I, I never had a leadership position in a larger company. Um, but in a smaller project, um, it's a smaller project, but um, uh, I find for myself, I like it because it's, um, I'm very passionate about what I'm working on. It's a smaller team. It's a little bit easier to manage. Um, usually the people I'm working with, um, whether they're getting paid or not, are there because they want to be. Uh, for some of the larger movies that I've worked on, which with no disrespect to them at all, a lot of the people I was working with, it was their job, and that's how they acted. And it didn't. It was. It was contagious. You know, it was hard to find people that were passionate, and uh, and sometimes that's a bummer. You know, I I was like when I was a kid, I was the hugest Star Wars fan in the world. So working with companies like Lucasfilm and working on Star Wars, it's such a bummer to be working with people on projects that aren't even Star Wars fans, and they're just like, ah, yeah. oh, it's a bummer. It just it's a it's a buzzkill. You know. So, um, so yeah, they're two completely different birds, but um, I really enjoy, at least right now, I'm enjoying the smaller, passionate, um, it's just a lot more fun for me at the moment. Thank you. In the back, we have a question from our online viewers. Mike on YouTube is asking, when a director assembles his crew for a feature film, what, ki what type of questions does he ask to make sure that the personality is compatible? Mm. Well, um, as far as the assistant director, which is you know all I can really speak about, um, sometimes the director does not pick the assistant director. Sometimes that's hired by the the producer. But you know the um, the the assistant director has to be a confidant to the director and kind of like a a goalie, like a hockey goalie, like you're you're blocking all the different questions and shots as much as you can and letting the things through that you know need to really trickle through because the director has like a million questions coming at them a day. So as an assistant director, you know, the director needs somebody who can really filter out what needs to get through and, uh, you know, be left alone to, to, to get the creativity, to get the, uh, to get the performances and all that stuff. But sometimes uh, the director does not get to hire the assistant director. Um, you spoke as leaders with dealing with bad apples. So I, my question is, how do you deal with a bad apple when you're a fellow crew member? Mm -hmm. Escalate. Uh, I would I would first talk to the, the leader that's involved. Um, so, you know, whoever that is, your direct boss or whatever, be like, hey, you know, I'm having problems with this person or this person is not contributing their value. Because ultimately being a leader, that is your job is to deal with these types of problems. Um, I mean, if you feel comfortable, I would talk with the person and be like, hey, I don't know if you know, but you're not contributing to this level. Or you know, some of the other people on the team have been kind of like, hey, you need to contribute at a higher level. Um, but if you're not comfortable, I would, I would take it straight to a leader. 
the you know, director or whoever. I see some bickering on uh, student films sometimes, and you know, uh, some of it is just immaturity and you know, not having a lot of experience working in a team. But you know, I can tell you that if you get a, one of these coveted roles on a on a on a movie, you know, you have to like really leave that at home. That you can't have like schoolyard bickering, like I see sometimes on the student films here. You know, you have to be professional, and that's not to say that it doesn't happen uh, at at different at the next level at, on bigger budget films. And it, in that case, you know, you you try to deal with it on your own, and then you could take it to your supervisor. But really, you know, gotta try to keep it professional and civil on set if you can. Mm -hmm. it, you know, if it's a stupid argument, then just I, I, I'm too busy to deal with some silly, immature thing. You know, but not to say it doesn't happen. But if you can not let that happen, that would be better. My question is, how do you handle? when the team is on the same page and everyone has the same vision, but the leader is dropping the ball in certain style of leadership and certain things that's supposed to get done to motivate the team as a whole. How do you handle that when you're on the other side, when you're not in a, in a leadership position without affecting that relationship, you know, creating any type of animosity between the company? Um, I feel like I'm answering a lot, sorry. Uh, there's a, there's a well-known kind of, uh, philosophy called, uh, leadership from the second chair or, um, directing or leading upwards, um, managing upwards. Uh, it tends to be one of the hardest things that I've learned how to do. Um, and I'm not great at it, but you know, you basically have to throw yourself upon the pike, of, uh, for the team, right? You know, you're like, well, is anybody else gonna go tell him he's being a shithead? No, okay, I will, right? So you go up and you know you start off by being you know polite and kind of feeding things to that person. Um, but I've I, I have gotten to the point where I've been very direct with uh, you know the director on a game and been like, hey, look, you know the team is behind you, um, but you're not confident in yourself, which is leading to lack of confidence in you. Right, like we are confident in what you're trying to do, but you are because the guy was new to what he was doing. He was very not confident, right? So I was like, you need to be confident, and you need to know that we have your back, right? Um, it, a lot of times when your uh, leadership is, you know, it's lonely at the top is is a well-known saying, um, because people aren't giving you feedback, right? When you're a uh, rank and file employee. You're, you're, you have a lead or you have a boss who is giving you feedback, hopefully, uh, on what you're doing right and what you're not doing right. Um, when you're in charge, there's no one to tell you that you're not doing a good job, especially if you aren't actively seeking uh, for feedback from people. So, um, you know, it, you kind of have to, again, as people have said, judge the room, you know, see where you are in the project. You know, if you are the lowest, maybe not go to the person who is the, the top employee or whatever. Um, but you know, one or two above is, is generally what I would, I would manage upwards. In my context, again, uh, you know, you just have to deal with it. You don't get to pick your boss. You don't get to say anything to your boss, but luckily it's always temporary and you always, you can always move on and then you never have to work with that person again. But, um, you know, it just goes along with having a thick skin. And I mean, I've been, abused and yelled at and screamed at and you know it's like okay well you're not you you're not gonna physically do anything to me so I'm not worried about that and the worst thing that could happen is that I'll get fired and it's freelance and I'll get another job so I mean I just you deal with it and you have a thick skin about it and you say to yourself when I'm the boss I will never act like that person mm -hmm. so what everybody that you work from you take something away from them whether it's good or bad I want to be like them or I will never be like them and again, for my, in my specific context, it's always temporary. So you can always say, okay, you know, 13 more wake-ups and then I never have to hear this a-hole again. Yeah. The other thing though about that is like, don't badmouth that person after you're done with that job, even yep. if they aren't the person that you ever want to work for again. Because you'll find that the industry, no matter what you're in, is super small. And uh, you always want to be the guy that takes the high road, you know? Yep. Great point. Okay. Thank you, and last question. Uh, my question is, um, what are some tips on leading a small group of animators on an animated series or short web series, you know, just something along those lines? Leading a small group of animators on an animated series? Um, 
I think it's 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 this the same as as leading any sort of team. I, I think it's you know if you're a leader, you have to manage up, you have to manage down, you have to protect your team, you have to support your team, you have to give them what they need to do their job, um, and you have to you know facilitate something that's going to increase the morale of that team to keep them motivated. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I think it's it's uh, no different than leading any other team, really, in my opinion. Yeah, just delegating tasks and making sure that everyone is crystal clear on what their job is, um, making sure that there's a fluidity, obviously, throughout, and that everyone is capable of keeping up par on the animation, anything like that. All right. Well, first of all, let me apologize to the group. I thought we had more time for audience questions. So if you didn't have a chance, hopefully these guys will stick around for a few minutes afterward and when we leave the room maybe there'll be opportunities for you to ask your questions directly so we want to thank you all for attending this session i think it was fantastic we want to especially thank our guests today grant chris larry lindsay and matt for their knowledge and valuable information and i hope everyone has a great day and one